So let me invite upon stage Dr. Sangeet Mittal, who is, uh, uh, doesn't need any introduction. He's a very prolific VR surgeon in Thind Eye Hospital, Jalandhar. And uh, I, th I always tell him that now you should have a room where you can keep all your, all your awards because every conference he collects at least three or four. So over to you, Dr. Sangeet. Thank you, Dr. Puja, for the kind introduction. <laughs> uh, I think uh, I've just started getting awards. We, <laughs> we it's, and I, I hope that ins inspires everybody because I'm in private practice. I don't have that institutional backup. And if I can win an award, anybody can win an award. I can assure you all this. So it's just a matter of time, matter of focus that anybody can win that. So my topic for today is pre-operative fundus drawing and its significance. And all fundus drawings in this courtesy is done by my dear friend, Dr. Rajiv Gupta. Uh, what is a cartogram? Cartogram in Oxford Dictionary is a map on which statistical information is shown in diagrammatic form, right? So what we are doing is we are making a fundus cartogram. So the basically the chart, uh, as Dr. Puja has also told you, is the, that is used is the Amsler Du Bois chart. And it has got uh, these three circles, right? The first, the first circle, the innermost circle is the equator. The second is the aura, and the last, uh, the yellow one is the junction of the pars plicata and the pars plana. And whatever uh, lesions you are seeing, you have to mark accordingly. And equator, uh, generally, how we study the equator is we uh, use the vortex range as one of the landmarks, and uh, then we mark the equator accordingly, right? And beyond the equator is the post-equator lesions, and uh, uh, sorry, in, uh, posterior to the equator are the post-equatorial lesions, and uh, the, the anterior to the equator are anterior and equatorial lesions. So this is a picture taken from the net only. Uh, it's a cartogram of the retina with the universal color coding. And Dr. Puja has nicely pointed out the different uh, colors that we use for different lesions. Uh, black, she pointed out mostly for pigmented scars. Uh, anything, any pigment which, pi which is in the attached retina is to be drawn black, right? And any pigment which is in the detached retina is to be drawn brown. And brown can also be used for the choroidal detachments or choroidal melanomas uh, or the other choroidal lesions also. So universe, uh, for blue uh, solid uh, drawings for the retinal folds, the uh, I think she has nicely covered all these things. I should skip these part. So uh, one thing, uh, as she mentioned, was that uh, orientation is one of the biggest problems that we face while we are learning indirect ophthalmoscopy and you or keep your drawing chart always inverted on the patient's chart chest and this maneuver what happens is it inverts the chart and you can draw the fundus as it appears in your condensing lens so when you will again re reinvert the chart you will it will give you a better orientation so i think we all used to follow this and uh, it, it is one of the best methods to make a good fundus drawing then each view how you do you measure the distance uh, uh, from where do you have to draw the lesion. So each view in the condensing lens measures around eight disc diameters. So you take three uh, simultaneous views and you will reach the aura, right? So uh, this is how you can measure the distance, how far it is from the disc and how uh, you have to draw the lesion at that particular point. Similarly, those uh, lines in the Du Bois chart give you clock hours, one to two, 12 clock hours, and uh, you have to point the lesion uh, to the precise location, uh, right? And you see, uh, if you are making a drawing here, you see uh, you have made, there's a, there's a nevus here. So if a good drawing will tell you that this nevus is at one o'clock position, right? And it is about three disc diameters in size, and it's six disc diameters away from the disc, right? So a good fundus drawing uh, will be able to give you this information. So wh why is it, uh, why there is a need for documentation? So regardless of the form of the records, that is electronic or paper records, whatever you are keeping, a good clinical record all keeps ha keeping helps in diagnosis, planning, treatment, and follow-up. 
to enhance the communication between different healthcare professionals, you need good uh, standardized uh, drawings, right? Clinical records are also valuable documents to audit the quality of your healthcare services and research, right? Uh, many of us won't have those wide field cameras. So you won't get that wide uh, peripheral pictures. So you have to make good fundus drawings to keep a good record. And for uh, investigating the medical legal issues, uh, so one thing is always there which is not documented means you have not seen. The courts will not listen to you. If you're not, if you're documented, they will, if you're not documented, they said you have not just seen this. You're just now saying that this would have been done, right? So this is a prototype case uh, of uh, retinal detachment surgery who has con undergone vitectomy with oil and then SOR and TRICO and uh, just, I'll just show how this record keeping helps. So this is the first case sheet, the demographics and the case history you keep and then a brief, when you are in the OPD, uh, you, you don't have time to make a full detailed drawing, just make a small drawing like this, right? Uh, just draw some uh, vessels, or even if you don't draw your vessels, just uh, uh, roughly you estimate, okay, this is the area of the detachment, and uh, here this small hemorrhage is there, or this is a lattice with the horseshoe tear. So in the OPD, you make a small uh, drawing, and uh, then when you are, uh, decided that you are going to operate, then you make a detailed fundus drawing, right? Like uh, this is the same case and a proper fundus drawing being done before the uh, patient is taken up for surgery. Then of course the consent form is there, the vitals monitoring and uh, so RD surgery needs also to be documented and in the RD surgery sheet also you make that small preoperative drawing and then uh, make whatever you have done properly on the uh, sheet, right? And then post-op again, similar uh, follow-up. So the drawing will help you uh, in following up the patient uh, very nicely, right? So the first and uh, most important uh, use of pre-operative fundus drawing is to go keep a good clinical report, which will help in diagnosis, planning treatment, and follow-up, right? And second is the to enhance communication with between different healthcare professionals. So if you, uh, if I want to say, if I want to take some second opinion, uh, I will ask that doctor, I have seen a patient who is a temporal retinal detachment, one o'clock to two o'clock or uh, particular hour, there's one horseshoe tear at 12 o'clock, one at, so it becomes a lot of confusing. So if you have drawn that drawing and you just sent the drawing across, uh, it will be a better communication. Or just uh, if you show, if you are, if you have made a drawing and you have to show it to your senior or to your professor, then uh, you just show the drawing and he'll understand what there is. Rather than you speaking one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock, so making the things confusing, that will, uh, this uh, helps to communicate better, right? It, it does not mean that uh, those things doesn't, ma don't, 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 doesn't matter, they also matter, but this is a better way of communication. Then clinical records are also valuable documents to audit the quality of healthcare services and research. When, when you suppose you are doing some research and you need, uh, there's one very, uh, what we did was we did a primary, uh, what we call the surgical pneumoretinopathy and we were trying to evaluate uh, our back uh, retrospectively some patients uh, and we didn't know how much tears were there in superiorly, how much were inferiorly and which patients had those tears. But when we looked at their drawings, we, all the things were there. So it always helps us to analyze our records later on. Then again, for medical legal issues, that, as I told you, not documented is not. Mm -hmm. There are more uh, uses, the documentation or this funded drawings helps in our improving our observational skills because we draw what we see, right? So we observe those things and we draw. And, and, and what we have learned is the more you draw, the more you observe, right? And more lesions you will pick up slowly and slowly if you are making a proper drawing. So it also helps in improving our observational skills. And it gives better information, even better than what fundus photograph sometimes gives you, right? Uh, Though there is some limitations of uh, the Amsler Dubois chart that we use, one of the uh, most important limitation is that the equator is actually the widest part of the eye, right? 
and ora is smaller than equator but what happens is in this circle the ora becomes the largest part so whatever lesions there are they are almost doubled up in size right so one thing always you have to keep in mind wh when you are doing the drawing right but still you one look at this drawing and one look at this whole collage of fundus photos which you which you i think this is much better way of uh, putting it through rather than it gives me gives me a better information uh, yeah, it also gives me a particular clock hours also where I, where the lesions are and it helps in planning of surgical steps like in like this drawing i know this is just one horseshoe tear here inferiorly i'll just do a buckle here and my problem will be solved and it, it's very important decision making so this this like this uh, i can i'll do a buckle i'll just go if my, even if my resident has drawn it i'll just see that there is uh, there's a small horseshoe tear i'll do a buckle here i'll just see there's a small hst and it is following the link of rule and so i'll just do a vitrectomy with the from the break site it but if i i see this kind of picture so what i will plan is i'll plan even if with a smaller uh, uh, retinal detachment i will plan a vitrectomy with encephalage because i know then there is a continuously ongoing process which will be keep uh, causing on more and more horseshoe tears later on so i like to support the whole of the vitreous space here so i'll plan a vitrectomy with encephalage so a proper drawing also helps you in decision making so uh, linkoff's rules uh, uh so it also helps in location of prim uh, primary breaks I, I, sometimes what happens is you are not able to see the breaks uh, pre operatively so uh, but if you have made a proper uh, drawing you can estimate where the breaks would be and intraoperative when the patient is under anesthesia you can better do examination and uh, look at the breaks so there are various uh, link of rules i won't go into the details of that and one more uh, disadvantage of amsler chart amsler dubois chart that we use is we cannot apply actually the linkoff's rules to the amsler dubois chart because linkoff's rule in uh, when you are applying the disk is always at the center of the chart right but in the amsler chart the disk is at one side and fovea is the center right so you don't apply blindly the linkoff's rules to that can always keep that shift in mind right so again it helps in visualization problems during surgery suppose uh, when you are operating you will have not made a drawing and suddenly a pupil becomes small there is a hypotonia and suddenly and you will just be lost what to do now but if you had made a drawing you will know that okay this lesion was here you will be able to uh, cover up many things just because of the drawing itself there is one example i had one patient i had done a numor retinopexy it, it was long time ago uh, and uh, i uh, i had done a numor retinopexy and the patient had end of thermitis after that unfortunately uh, we gave him the patient the intravitreal injection and uh, because i knew that the break is at this position and i just did a buckle in that place and gave an intravitreal injection and the patient res responded well to the intravitreal injection and the buckle covered the uh, retinal detachment part of it otherwise i had had to give uh, do a vitrectomy and other things for that patient so uh, uh, it helps in visualization problems even not even during surgery after even after surgery also so this is one patient uh, uh, this patient had a pre operatively we knew that there is a, there are breaks in the attached retina also although this was a small detachment we doing a vitrectomy here we there were two uh, horseshoe tears and we just flattened the retina and it nicely flattened and we did uh, cryo here so if we if i had not had that pre operative drawing in my, my in my uh, uh, mind i would have may have missed the uh, break that was in the attached retina as you see uh, so but i had that pre operative drawing in my hand i knew that there was a break in the attached retina and so i i was able to uh, cover that also a small uh, briefly because uh, i wanted to include this that what is the importance of proper fundus examination before cataract surgery because many cataract surgeon we tend to miss doing a proper fundus examination uh, beforehand so one the most important is to avoid your visual surprises to prevent retinal detachments and to diagnose uh, any kind of lesions which predispose the patient to retinal detachment post cataract surgery 
sometimes to maintain visualization and to choose compatible IOs if there are some uh, retinal problems, you have to choose compatible IOs, IOs and manage coexisting conditions like if there's cataract and diabetic retinopathy also to manage them. So you need to do a proper uh, fundus examination before cataract surgery. And avoid uh, visual surprises. What are visual surprises? Many times we have seen cataract surgeons talking about the refractive sur surprises. Refractive surprises are refers to poor outcome due to post-op refractive error and can which can be corrected by either by changing the IOL or by doing a refractive surgery. But visual surprise refers to poor visual outcome due to a macular problems which are not detected preoperatively because the patient's fundus was not examined and this cannot be corrected as macula cannot be exchanged, right? So the better safe than sorry, pre-existing condition becomes a complication if you miss a problem. Everyone will assume that the surgery caused it. Patient's expectations at this time are at all time high. Uh, small incision refractive cataract surgery, femto laser, wavefront technology, intraoperative abrometry, high end costly IOLs, marketing results in ex high expectations. And super patient expects that he'll get supervision after surgery. But, uh, pardon? Yes, yes. <laughs> so unhappy patient despite a flawless surgery and a perfect refractive outcome and having a macular problem will give you problems later on, right? So to conclude, precise documentation is essential for multiple reasons. Most importantly, accurate surgical planning. A detailed drawing improves our observational skills. The notes made during the drawing of a fundus can often provide more details than photography. And a cautious, thorough approach is appreciated by patients and it results in a happy patient despite poor visual outcome. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sangeet. Uh, if anyone has any questions, we can, we are very, we'll be ha very happy to take them up over the next five minutes. Ma'am? focus there and then when I come back, uh, I Dr. Dr. Abhishek, would you like to? So even after decreasing the chlorine, it helps to the minimum we have problem? Okay. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's so I think uh, actually I was going through these chlorinates uh, in, in the yeah, sample. Yeah, now I've seen that. So yeah. they go pretty down. So I don't think in like height should be a problem in your case. So I think it's a little bit more of you need a little bit more practice to make it perfect. Uh, other than that, I don't see height. I think it's more of your mind block. That's all. I also had this problem when I started. I, uh, my height was also very small <laughs> as compared to normal. And I also had the benches were too high. What I did was just cut the legs of that benches and just made them sit down <laughs> and adjust it. I think the best position is your waist height. The table should be your waist height. Yes. Yeah, and then you can uh, properly examine the tissue. Okay. And that also will not uh, strain your back also. Sir, how often practically that third circle helped uh, between aura and pars planar? No, I have never used it. <laughs> I have never used it. <laughs> pars planar, it's very difficult even to visualize. <laughs> it's so far anterior that if the patient is highly myopic, it's a different thing. But otherwise, it's quite anterior. I have never used it myself. Actually. Choice of indenter, like which do you use? Uh, it actually, it all depends upon what you are comfortable with. Uh, in SM, we were used to, we were taught to use that thimble type of depressor. And in PJ, I was taught to use that rod type, uh, one side smaller. And so I am comfortable with any of them, but it's, it's a matter of what you are comfortable with. Shivani, any tips when you are uh, examining ROP babies? Any indirect ophthalmoscopy tips? So the babies are more difficult to handle, but if we properly wrap the baby and give them a uh, five 25 uh, dextrose uh, su to suck, the babies automatically they pacify and then we don't need to struggle with the baby. 
basically they are the uh, then they become the easier lot to uh, do the uh, ios but the most important thing to keep in mind is uh, the baby's eyes are a smaller eyes so we don't need to indent to a deeper depth we have to keep it inferior towards the limbus so then we can uh, see uh, we can uh, already see the uh, aura in those cases and what lens do you use uh, ideally it should be 28d but uh, we can always accommodate according to the lenses available and one more thing is you ask the parents to stay outside yeah. that, that is the most difficult thing to contain the mothers, <laughs> because so the mothers starts crying uh, when they see the babies crying so it's very necessary to pacify them and then keep them uh, waiting outside and tell them nothing is going to happen and that's the way proper counseling of the uh, yeah. parents so arati vedi is also we need to keep one thing in mind that uh, to re move the eyes in very very close there is a different vectric kind of uh, indenters coming so we need to use them rather than the normal indenters so thank you uh, everyone for this uh, you know uh, i hope that uh, our uh, limited span of one hour has incited some interest in you all mm -hmm. to uh, master the techniques of indirect ophthalmoscopy and i uh, believe me uh, always uh, aim at buying the instrument if you buy the instrument then you'll be more motivated to learn so uh, it it could be any any make it could be it could be upper somi it could be anything but uh, always try to have an instrument which you buy so you know then it will be make, make you more motivated to learn and uh, the other things Yeah, I, I must think. I must just last. I think this should be the com concluding remarks. Indirect ophthalmoscopy is just a matter of practice. So there is nothing much involved in it, right? So the more you practice, the more you will get better, right? And everybody should go do indirect ophthalmoscopy. I always tell my residents, this is the second best thing you can do in dark. <laughs> <laughs>